Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Buckeye Weekly Podcast. I am Tony Gerdeman, here as always with Tom or Tom. How's it going? Tony, I'm ready for our first real, true college football weekend. We were at a stadium on a Saturday morning and we get to watch a game on a Saturday and then we get to come home and watch the night, you know, the evening games. And it is I, last Saturday was a lot of fun because we didn't, you know, didn't have to go anywhere. You just could just watch a full Saturday. I'm ready to have like a normal for us college football Saturday. And I'm just, you know, I mean, fa- fans in the stands, all the, all the good stuff that you missed last year. I am really looking forward to it again this year. Yeah. And I'm looking forward to, uh, I'm glad that if there is a week that we weren't able to just sit at home and watch it's, it's not this week. Cause it's not a great week of football compared to last week, which was a, a very good week of games, but on the average, uh, on the above average, when you have weeks where you're like, yeah, it doesn't look like a great week, crazy stuff happens. Crazy games happen. They end up being wildly entertaining. And you're like, where did that come from? So we're going to talk about the weekend of games. We didn't get a chance to do this last week. I don't want to say we ran out of time and forgot to record a podcast because last week was very, very difficult in terms of the week being scrunched down and then being out of state. And it just um, like, we did not forget per se. We just didn't actually remember that we were going to do it until it was too late to do it. So here we are. We time, we could just preview last week's and nail everything. <laughs> I think that's, that's the way to go. You want to do bold week one, bold predictions <laughs> for Ohio state football too. Cause I, I, I I'm going to be on that one. I don't need to. I already did it. And I was on that one. So, mm. um, you know, so thank you for reminding everybody of that time, but let's, let, let's do start. We're going to talk about, you know, a handful of games. We do have to begin with Oregon, Ohio state. We'll talk a little bit about it. We already did a whole preview show that you guys can listen to already, but for those not uh, privy to that show. We don't want to ignore this. The over under is 63 and a half time. I think both of our picks went over on this. I went 42, 24 Ohio state. You went 45, 28 Ohio state. So yeah, Ohio state covering Ohio state and going comfortably over that number. And this was something we talked about before the season where we thought this game would be by a wider margin than Minnesota because Ohio state would just want to get out of Dodge with the Minnesota game. Or is this the one they might want to be a little bit more secure? For one, the Oregon offense is capable of doing more things, so you want to just keep the foot on the pedal. And for two, uh, it's at home, and you want to show the crowd a good time. And, hey, hey, let's throw it in the fourth quarter. Of course, they did throw the ball in the fourth quarter in Minnesota as well, but they needed those points. So, yeah, both, uh, both picking Ohio State to cover. To go with the over, not recommending anybody do any gambling. Would never recommend that. That's, uh, you know unless you want to, but I, I will not be, but if I were, but I'm not also not recommending anybody else do that. Tom, let's move to the next 12 PM game, which is really interesting to me. And, and I don't know if it's interesting to anybody else, the Johnny majors, classic Pitt <laughs> being hosted, going to Tennessee next year, Pitt will host this game. Pittsburgh is a three point favorite in Neyland stadium there in Knoxville which seems insane to me. I don't know that it's a fireable offense to be a home underdog to pit, but it should go on your record. And this is a bizarre game. I mean, that line that jumped out to me, but even more so over under 56 and a half in this one. I mean, Joe Milton did not look fantastic for Tennessee last week. He's going up against Pat Narduzzi, who generally has pretty good defenses and whose offenses do not score a whole lot of points. So this game is going to end up 30 to 27. I don't really see that happening. So I'm not sure. I'm not sure how you're getting over 56 and a half on that one. That, that one seemed a little odd to me, but yeah, Tennessee is bad. Like Tennessee is very bad. It, it is, you know, they just had a coaching change, which generally is a good indication that yes, things are not great, but that was, they played Bowling Green. In week one, Bowling Green is one of the worst teams in all of FBS. And it was like they played Thursday night. And it was one of those games that I kind of kept turning around and looking at the scoreboard in Minnesota. And it was just like, did, have they not updated that score? It, it was, you know, it was like they were in the 20s for a, a, quite a while, it seemed like. 
that that's a game you should, you know, if you're a good team, you should beat Bowling Green by 50. And I, I don't think they got close to that last week. That's, that's a concern because Pitt is, Pitt is a team that will rise up and get a good team every once in a while. I just, that, that just seems to me like, you know, t- Tennessee plus three, whatever that over under like that, just that number seems very high to me. It is a team that will rise up and get somebody every now and again, but also a team that will lower itself to get and got in a game <laughs> like this. Milton last week, 11 for 23 for 139 yards, one touchdown. Tennessee did rush for 331 yards, had two separate ball carriers over 100 yards. Pitt threw for 375 yards against UMass last week. They rushed for 223 yards. They have an explosive offense against UMass, but UMass, Tennessee, you know, might not be much of a difference there. Probably some, but that's, that's maybe the, that's me just giving Tennessee too much credit. I, uh, yeah, it seems like if Tennessee can only score 38 against Bowling Green. Again, don't make sweeping judgments about week one, but they're going to need almost that against Pitt to, um, to make this, to, to make this an over. So yeah, I, I like the, the under as well. I would never ever bet Pitt unless like Clemson is involved and there's something that you just get a, a, a wonky feeling. And you're like, you know what? I feel a little, I, I feel a little um, goosey and let's just try it and see, but I'm avoiding all Pitt and Tennessee as much as my, uh, as much as I can, honestly. That's a, that's a pretty good thing to do. I mean, that's, if you're doing a college football elimination diet, like Pitt and T- Pitt and Tennessee should be a couple of the last things you bring back in. Like that's not, you don't, you don't need that. That's, that, that's like, uh, you know, the, the real spicy curry, except they're the exact opposite of spicy curry in terms of like the interest level of play. So yeah, I, it, it's fine. Like this is one of these games that if I, I this is not one that I'm devastated to miss, put it that way. <laughs> That, uh, that we're, you know, so a lot of times we're covering games and it's like, man, I can't believe that other games on at the same time. And we, you know, obviously we enjoy our, or enjoy our jobs and all of that. But, you know, if you're at the game, you miss you miss getting to watch whatever other games are on at the same time. This is not one that I'm going to uh, feel compelled to DVR and rewatch later. One that I, we don't really need to really spend too much time on. I just want to get a quick uh, thought from you on Air Force, Navy. It's the, the smallest over under of the week, 40 and a half points. What are you doing? Yeah. If you don't know, my brother went to the Naval Academy. So I am a, uh, I've long been a fan of the Navy football. I've been to a bunch of army Navy games. Annapolis is a beautiful place to see a football game. They do not have, they do not have the good Navy quarterback this year. They do not have the Keenan Reynolds quarterback this year, which then means they're not going to be very good. Um, So yeah, Navy's a six point dog at home. It, these are so uh, they're all of these academy games are so low scoring like it's uh, they generally are you know 20 to 14 kind of game so i th- i think this is probably a stay away from me but if you felt like you absolutely had to i i have very little faith in navy this year so i would probably take air force my question tony is you see these space force commercials on tv when do we get a Space Force Academy so we can have a fourth team in the Commander in Chief's Trophy uh, competition? That's what I want to know. I just hope that when Space Force finally does have a team, they don't go to the triple option. They're just, they throw it constantly. They're your <laughs> Presbyterian, where it's just, you know, just constant offense. If your name is, is the Space Force and you run the triple option, no, you can't. You can't run the triple option. You can run sometimes, but if you're the Space Force, you better be throwing the ball because space, air, pretty much the same thing. Except, Tom, um, there is no air in space. So maybe you have to run the ball because there is no air in space. I don't know, Tom. Maybe it's best we don't have a Space Force team. This is this is when I remind you that we're literally talking about Air Force, which runs the triple option. <laughs> you know where there's air? In the air. That's uh, that's where planes go. So, yeah, it's it, it's not... I'm not sure you thought that one all the way through, maybe most of the way through, but yeah. That's, no, not even most. Not, not even most, yeah. None of the way through. That's, that's going to be... Uh, yeah, that, that's another one that like normally the, I, I will, you know, seek out Navy games. I, I have a weird uh, service academy triple option thing that I, I just I always find that football much more enjoyable than most people do. But yeah, that's uh, I don't I don't think that one's going to be a good, a particularly good one. I've always liked Air Force. D. Dowis is my guy for the old school people out there. Next game, Ball State at Penn State, number 11, Penn State. 
Some people out there, Tom, think this is a trap game. Penn State is favored by 22 and a half. They have Auburn next week for the whiteout game. They got the road win at Wisconsin. They're feeling high and mighty, even though I don't know if you can feel high and mighty after such a difficult win. You can be happy with it, but you better not think, hey, hey, look at us. We're fantastic. We, we can do anything. I, I saw that uh, Penn State had 17 minutes and nine seconds of possession last week. And you thought Ohio state didn't have the ball. Like Penn state did not have the ball. And they only rushed for like 50 yards. Noah Kane was 48 of that on like eight carries. So he did well, you know, six yards of carry with his few attempts. But uh, this seems like it's an over under 58, which seems high to me because I don't know that Ball state's going to score more than, you know, 17. And I don't know that Penn state is capable of scoring 42 against almost anybody at this point. So if I'm betting anything, I'm probably I'm going to go the under, and I'm probably uh, probably not taking it, uh, touching that, uh, that that 22 and a half though. Well, and Ball State is one to know, and I thought I wonder who Ball State played last week. Uh, they played Western Illinois. Tony, do you know what Western Illinois' mascot is? Is it the uh, the Leathernecks? It is the Leathernecks. Yes, Boom. and uh, Ball State won that game by a score of uh, all of 31 to 21. So. That's probably the the one to know is maybe not quite as impressive as it is it looks on uh, on paper. So, yeah, I, I, Penn State should blow them out. Penn State should be able to completely physically overwhelm them. But I have questions about Penn State's offensive line. I you know it is a it is a absolute sandwich game spot. You wonder if that gets negated a little bit by the fact that it's the first home game for them and you get fans back in the stands and that's pretty exciting. So maybe that's that gets you a little more juice than it, it normally would. But yeah, I, I I can't imagine taking Ball State and just like praying the whole game that, that Penn State just, you know, it has to settle for a bunch of field goals and open receivers drop balls and stuff like I just that that there's there's nothing appealing about either of those lines to me. It just. If if I if I put something if I put money on it then I have to care about it. This is not a game I want to care about. The the halftime score of that Western Illinois game I believe was seven seven. Mm. So who was winning? Um, yeah, nobody. Mm. Nobody was winning. <laughs> Everybody was losing. In fact, the next game three thirty kick Texas A and M number five Texas A and M they play in the SEC West, so you know they're good. They won last week. They are they are head, heading to Colorado where the Aggies are a 17-point favorite. Over under on this is 50. Haynes King, the Texas A&M redshirt freshman quarterback, threw uh, two touchdowns and three interceptions last week. Did not look great. Things finally picked up towards the end of the game against Kent State, but Kent State was in that for quite a while before Texas A&M finally just, you know, what every Power 5 team does against uh, a, a – not what every good – to really good power five team does in that situation. They just wear and wear and wear. And finally, Kent State got busted. But this is kind of interesting to me. Colorado, um, uh, they're, they're starting a, a – their starting quarterback went down in camp, so they're starting a redshirt freshman, and he played okay in their season opener, which I should have written down, but I didn't. Northern uh, Colorado. They yeah, exactly. That's why I didn't because it was um, you know, an FCS – game not a lot to to judge there but you know uh, i i don't i was not impressed by texas a&m for the first two and a half quarters and then you look at the score and it's like well okay colorado you want to hope that things are going in the in the right direction sometimes they are sometimes they're not you just never know and we'll see what texas A&M, a&m can do on the road i'm interested to see just how they perform on the road Jimbo Fisher says, don't worry about the altitude. I've done the altitude before, and it's never a problem. So we will uh, see there. And the altitude is really, you hear about it, and it's not necessarily as big a deal as people make it out to be. I mean, it's it's a difference. And I mean, it obviously applies to baseballs flying further and that kind of stuff. But you know, this is this is like exertion. There's less oxygen in the air, the higher above out yet above sea level you are. I was on vacation this summer out in like Yellowstone and Grand Tetons, and we did a bunch of hiking up in the mountains and, you know, you you get winded, 
because but you know part of that is you're hiking up in the mountains and there's some real steep stuff and it it doesn't it doesn't you know you you don't like lose the ability to run at that you know it's it's like there will be a little bit of a cumulative effect but it's not i don't think that is as big a deal as people make it out to be the program that has the highest uh altitude field in all of fbs is uh, wyoming and wyoming is not like wildly dominant in in at home and they're at like 7000 feet they're they're like 2000 feet higher than than uh, boulder is so yeah, I, I think that's a little little overplayed. I do think that I would, if I was going to do something, I would lay the points with Texas A and M here. It just this just seems like a game where you're going to feel, you know, you don't want to feel dumb. You don't want to be the guy who's like, well, I'm getting the 17 points is a lot, and you know, are they really this much worse than and the, the answer? A lot of times, you, you talk yourself into that, and the answer is almost always yes. It turns out like just as you're watching, you're going to be hating yourself the whole game. You're going to be miserable the whole game. So if you, uh, if you felt like doing something, I would do a uh, Texas A&M given 17, but this is another one where it's like, yeah, we're, we're, we're just at the point of the, uh, the season where you have just enough information to be really dangerous. Cause you don't know how much the information actually means you, you have data, but you don't actually know how much it really means yet. So that's, uh, th- th- that's, I, I don't. I don't have a real, real strong uh, uh, opinion on that one. This is one of those games where Texas A and M starts out like fourteen nothing after four minutes, and you just you, you hate yourself for the next three hours because of what you did, and then for the next day after that as well. the uh, The next three thirty game UAB at Georgia, number two Georgia, over under forty five. Georgia's favored by twenty four. Interestingly. Okay, Georgia is favored by 24. It opened as Georgia minus 29. So this has come down quite a bit. Uh, you know, Georgia is missing some guys due to COVID, which they missed against Clemson, which is the entire reason, Tom, that uh, the offense struggled for for Georgia. I um, you know, I have not necessarily like meant to stay away from the rankings and follow them. It's just that they're meaningless, so I haven't followed them. But uh, Georgia jumping, I don't know, were they like number five and then they jumped to number two with the win over Clemson? You know, whatever. I had somebody ask about uh, something about the rankings last week, and I'm like, I I don't follow them. I don't know. And then a couple of days later, he's like, hey, do you know when the rankings come out? I'm like, please see my previous DM. I do not follow (laughs) the rankings. And and there's no point to follow them, except they do kind of form a foundation for the committee, especially at the outset. And they, they, they provide some justification for the committee. And so I, I don't want to say they're meaningless. They should be meaningless, but you know, they're meaningless to me. Like I can't, I don't, I don't look at them at all. And I, I it's not that I'm staying away. It's just, you know, I'm fortunate that way. Yeah. It, that's one of those things that I just, I can't make myself care about those. Like, I'm sorry. It doesn't matter. Like it used to matter a lot. Now it doesn't matter at all, especially this early in the season. Cause you've got a bunch of noise in the polls right now where people, you know, some people rank teams based on where they think they're going to finish the season. Some people, pe- some people rank teams based on resume. That is actually the correct way to do it. Like if you have a team that wins a really impressive game week one, that that team should be ranked really highly. So yeah, I have no problem with Georgia being number two. Now, at some point, the fact that Georgia is going to play, be playing nothing but a steaming pile of garbage for the next 10 weeks doesn't, you know, that that should at some point catch up with them. And then if Ohio State beats Oregon by 17, 20 points, Ohio State should be headed ahead of Georgia next week. But I, you have people who rank the teams in all these different ways. And so you end up with these, these results that are like, this doesn't make any sense. And it's like, yes, that's because everyone has these different ways of doing it. And then they just compile all of these different pieces. It's like ask ask a bunch of people to write like two bars of music and then just smash them all together and it's like this doesn't sound very good it's like well yes everyone is doing there was no planning involved here everyone's just doing their own thing and it's like how did we go from steel drums to like classical to like reggae like what wow wow that's that's basically the early season college football polls there's there's so much in this world that you can get angry about like just just save it spare spare yourself the annoyance just don't don't pay attention to those polls absolutely and the the musical thing you're talking about that's how we got we are the world <laughs> and i thought that worked out perfectly 
Who does Dan Aykroyd have in his top 25? <laughs> aliens. Uh, he's big on aliens, Tom. Did you know that? <laughs> I did not know that, but I'm excited to Google that as soon as we're done. Also ghosts. Hmm. Who knew? Busted. All right, Tom. That's enough. Let's go to perhaps the, I think the biggest game of the week, other than, of course, Ohio State and Oregon at 430. And let me just say, I like how do I like the the ABC moving to a 1 p.m. and a 430. It's interesting. It's different. Gets them off off schedule, the 12, 12 p.m. and the 330 games. It's just, you know, something new. This 430 on ABC, Iowa at Iowa State. Number 10, Iowa at number nine, Iowa State. Over under a 46. I don't know how they're going to get there. Iowa State is a four and a half point favorite. They struggled big time. Iowa State did 16 to 10 win over Northern Illinois, Northern Iowa last week, which everybody does. Uh, everybody from Iowa always struggles with Northern Iowa. Sometimes they even lose to Northern Iowa. Brees Hall, their outstanding All American running back, only rushed for 60, 69 yards on 23 Creek. 23 carries, not a, a very nice performance. Iowa State has lost five in a row in this series. Their last win was in 2014. Matt Campbell, Tom, 0-4 against Iowa. They need this one as badly as anybody needs anything. Matt Campbell, I know people keep talking about him going to Michigan. Michigan already has their Matt Campbell and Jim Harbaugh because neither one of these guys can beat their rivals. Matt Campbell, poor Matt Campbell, and I will I will not stand for your Matt Campbell slander. Look at look at Iowa State's record historically, and then look at what Matt Campbell has done. Like if if he is John Cooper, you know if he is John Cooper because he wins games and uh, but can't you know win the, win against his rival. Guess what? John Cooper's in the College Football Hall of Fame. Like that that's a perfectly acceptable career for a football coach. Matt, Matt Campbell is a fantastic coach, and if I was Nebraska, I would be begging him to to come take my job. And uh, Michigan, I would pay him to do it. <laughs> it's amateurism. Now you're not allowed to do that. You can just you can just let him do a commercial. That's all. I I, I look at this Iowa team, and it's like, oh, this. I mean, I have I have talked all summer about the fact that like the, this this might be the good Iowa year. And you don't want to read too much into week one, as you may have heard us say once or 17 times this, this, uh, this week, you don't want to read too much into week one, but man, they just beat the dog out of Indiana and Indiana should be a pretty decent team. And you get the weird Kinnick thing and this one's on the road. So you don't, you don't get the benefit of the Kinnick thing, but man, this, this Iowa defense looks real, real good. And I you know, I'm I'm looking at Iowa State minus four and a half, and it's like I don't like I, I don't I don't know that I think that Iowa State's going to win this game, let alone win this game by more than a field goal. This game is close a lot. Four and a half seems like a ton of points, and I think that line's down. I think that line was six at one point, not not long ago. So, yeah, I I think Iowa give, give me the five and a half points, and over under forty six. I might take the under i feel stronger about the uh iowa plus four and a half but you know for, 46 points doesn't seem like a lot but iowa's defense is real real good and their offense is not exactly uh you know andre Ware, david klingler era houston so they you know they're probably going to try and take the air out of the football a little bit and and you know run the clock and run the ball and all that so i you know if, if uh if we were in uh Council Bluffs, Iowa this weekend. I might I might look at uh, Iowa plus four and a half uh, parlayed with the under 46 there. Yeah, that's what I would be doing as well. The the uh, the Hawkeyes needed two defensive touchdowns to score 31 points last week against Indiana. We know Indiana has a very good defense, like 24-21, something like that, and a win for Iowa, and, and you stick the under, and you, you go home happy on that one. I'm We'll get to see maybe – Maybe some of the end of that one up in the press. Yeah, probably up in the press box. Although I'll probably be listening to it on the way home, trying to get home for the the kickoff of the Michigan-Washington game. Let's move uh, quickly, Tom, to 7 p.m. kickoff, Texas at Arkansas. At least I don't – is that in Jerry World rather than, than at Arkansas? Uh, Maybe. Arkansas 
plus seven in this over under 56 and a half for me, Tom, if you can be an sec West team, if Texas can be an sec West team here, then, then I will, I am all in on Texas being back because teams, you just, you just don't beat an sec West team. And so this is Texas's chance. However, I would 100% pick Arkansas if Tom Herman was still the coach. This is this is a game that Tom Herman loses. Right now, I don't really have any expectations for Arkansas. I don't expect them to just continue to beat themselves. I think Sam Pittman has them in the right direction. I'm kind of feeling Texas right now because they have B. John Robinson. He had 103 yards rushing last week, 73 yards receiving. They're giving him the ball. I think he had like 25 touches or something. Continue to do that. Good things will happen. Eventually, he'll, he'll bust bust something or make something happen. So I am uh, – that seven's a lot, though. <laughs> As I'm looking at it, seven is a lot. I uh, – uh, I, I may I – may, uh, yeah, I may take the points there. This is a true road game. This is in Fayetteville. Okay. So, I mean, Texas was real good, real good in week one because – you look at you look at that and it's Texas played Louisiana and Mm -hmm. that that looks like every other boring you know if you're just looking at the ticker and you don't you don't really know anything about the teams you just look at that you're like oh well they beat you know a terrible Sunbelt team and yeah of course they killed the terrible Sunbelt team Louisiana is really good like Billy Napier is a good coach Billy Napier is going to be a guy who's coaching a big brand SEC team sooner rather than later he has had opportunities and he has not left so he is he is a very, very good coach. That is a very good program. That's a program that could be top 25 at the end of the year. That Texas team is pretty intriguing to me. And I mean, how many, how many times have I said, you don't want to be the idiot who is, you know, backing, backing this team and then immediately going, why did I do that? I know this. Always. And it's like, no, 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 no. But this is Texas. Like Texas, Texas is definitely back now. They beat the Sun Belt and like every, everything about this game says to me, Texas minus seven, you know, they, they should be able to, to bully Arkansas a little bit because Arkansas was not super impressive week one, but yeah, I, I think, I think the PTSD is going to kick in and, and there's, there's just, there's no way I could, I could talk myself into like actually, actually putting anything on that. Like I, it, it seems like Texas should win, which is generally what about when the roof falls in. Mm-hmm. We'll see if that remains true with Sark. And, you know, it has rem- certainly remained true under Charlie Strong and Tom Herman and the end of Mac Brown and uh, anyone else. I'm sure I've missed I'm sure I've missed some Texas to Texas t- uh, coaches who definitely had Texas back until it wasn't. But, yeah, I, I, it seems like it should be Texas by double digits. But that's that's right when uh, th- that's how they get you, Tony. That's how they get you. Yeah, I'm steering clear as well. I even like the under, but at the same token, I can see this being 45, 42, and you're just like, you know, how? Why? Like, well, it's because it doesn't make any sense. That's why you stupid idiot. What? Stop trying to make sense of something that doesn't make sense. It's Texas and Arkansas. It's rivals for one. Not that any of these kids kids playing in the game uh, were born when uh, there actually was a Texas Arkansas rivalry necessarily. But let's move to 8 p.m. kickoff. Washington at Michigan. Michigan favored by seven, over under 48 and a half. A lot of luster was lost on this game when Washington lost to Montana and looked bad doing it. Dylan Morin, Dil- Dylan Morris, Washington quarterback, threw three interceptions. Washington <laughs> rushed for 65 yards in the game against Montana. They were missing their top three receivers. So run the ball, and they couldn't. And they uh, they did not look good in this at all. Tom, do you remember Giles Jackson? I do remember Giles Jackson. Isn't he a Michigan receiver a few years ago? He was. He is now at Washington. Oh my gosh! Do you think he has like the the keys to the locker room and can get in and and uh, you know put like icy hot in their jocks or something like that? That no. would be such a that would be such a crazy prank. Tom, uh, Michigan Stadium is so old. All you need are skeleton keys. They get you anywhere. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, he had four catches for 15 yards last week, two rushes for 19 yards. So they use them a lot like Michigan, which is to say in short yardage and sweeps and stuff. 
I think you need to instead. They had all, all like only one receiver averaged over 10 yards per catch last week, and it was like 10.2. They need to stretch the field against Michigan, I think, vertically more so than horizontally. I think you can try to stretch it horizontally, but Dax Hill is there. And so, you know, don't don't stretch horizontally to his side. Go go for the deep stuff. Throw some haymakers. I say this like I say this all the time. Attack Michigan down the field and see what happens. It it's not going to be all bad. And at least a third of the time it's going to be good. Half the time it's going to be fine. Just take some shots. But you've got to give your quarterback time. Aiden Hutchinson uh, had uh, some he, he was an impactful player last week. We'll see what the rest of that defensive line does for Michigan. I, uh, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and lay those points. And uh, I, I think I'm going on the under as well. But I, there's, it's crazy. To take an under with Michigan's defense right now, I can't do it. So I will just lay the points and I'll steer clear of the over-under. Can, can I remind you that uh, Washington hit a total of twenty last week, I mm-hmm. believe, in mm-hmm. the uh, against Montana. So, yeah, I what, do you, what was this line like two weeks ago? Do you know? Did, mm-hmm. Has this line moved substantially? Because this this was one that I I hadn't. Do you, do you know? Or no, you I, I'll look. Oh, you'll see okay, find it. yeah, this was one that you know it feels a lot different now than it did a week ago because Michigan looked real good in week one. And Washington looked exceptionally bad in week one. Like this, this feels like a game that should should have been like a pick 'em over the summer or you know, a point or two. And and a seven point line feels like this is the wild overreaction line after week one, where it's like, well, Texas, you know, Texas and Notre Dame, did you see the game they played? Or or uh, you know, that was the, that was years ago, but you know, Notre Dame and and uh Florida State, did you see the game they played? Oh, Notre Dame has the heart of a champion. Oh, look at that, and then you know, it's like, well, it turns out Florida State's probably not that good this year. Like, it, it just, this feels like the wild overreaction line, which means I feel like you should take the points. Mm. But the longer you were talking there, the more I was like, well, how do you beat Michigan? You throw it down the field. Well, their quarterback's not great. Uh, and you run the ball right at them. And they couldn't do that against Montana. So I don't know if they can do that against Michigan. And it's like, well, you'll feel like an idiot if you take Michigan because it's like, well, this is very clearly the overreaction to week one line, but also I can't really make a compelling case the other direction either. It opened at five and a half. I am, I am always, uh, I, I, it's hard to get Rocky Lombardi and Ricky white out of my mind in terms of the Michigan secondary. I know when we both picked scores at the end of last week's Michigan Monday, we were both on the, the under. On this, you went 23 14. I went 34 7. So, um, yeah, it's time for Tom, it's time for us to have faith in this Michigan defense. So, I would take the under and I would lay the points. Yeah, I, I get to feel bad no matter what I do. Like, if you, no matter which one you pick, it's just like you, you could see this coming. How could you not see this coming? But there's two conflicting pieces of information that are going to be seem screamingly obvious, like at halftime of this game, which is yes. unfortunate. It's that's a, uh, that's what makes it so much fun. Some of the information will be false. Other, other of the information will have been confirmed by Snopes. <laughs> uh, two quick games left here. Utah, BYU, the Holy War, 10, 15 kick. Utah favored by seven. Utah with nine straight wins in this series. However, it's been disco- the the score has been decided by uh games have been dis- decided by one score uh, for uh, 8 of the last 10 years, Tom. So 80% of the time this game is close every time, which is uh which is good. BYU beat Arizona week 1. Yeah, I, I uh these rivalry games that are lopsided eventually something has to give unless it's of course Ohio State, Michigan. I don't really have any good feelings one way or another, and I would never gamble on uh, BYU or Utah out of respect. Yeah, this, yeah, this, this seems like a team, the BYU team, that's going to have to take a step back this year. They had kind of the, they, they were at one level for quite a while and then shot way up with Zach Wilson last year. And then now I think they're going to be back to the, the previous level. And Utah is just like, Utah is one of the, I think, more the more underappreciated teams in the country where I just, I don't know if people understand what a good job Kyle Whittingham does with that team and how well coached they are. They just, they are just like very consistent. That's not a, that's not an area where you've got like just killer access to talent. 
it's just they they just they do what they do they do it very well they they have a formula it's like you know like poor man's mountain wisconsin basically so it's just they they do what they do very well it's generally a very fundamentally sound team they just I, I would I would tend to pick Utah if this wasn't a rivalry game, but it is a rivalry game, and those are, you know, it is it is one of the throw the records out kind of things, and it is at at BYU. So yeah, I I don't know that I see uh, anything I would have a real strong opinion about here. But Utah, uh, the, str- the strongest opinion I have is Utah is very good, and you should probably like them. You should pay more attention mm-hmm. to them because they're they're a pretty good uh, pretty good program. Yeah, and they usually have a talented running back and a quarterback that can get some stuff done, and they're just sneaky. The last game here, Stanford at number 14, USC, over under 53.5 points. USC favored by 17, which is a lot. Stanford did not look good in their last game. Their first game, USC looked pretty good. This is a – I'm just seeing danger signs here because I feel like this is USC all day, and then I remember Clay Helton is still at USC. So that gives me some pause. However, I, should I, is this the year is USC back? Tom, is this year we can expect them that I think they, what they beat San Jose state last week, San Jose state was the conference winner last year. So it's not like they're San Jose state's pretty decent and USC was pretty good against them. Stanford, was not good. Yeah, I, I'm, it's, I'm just waiting for the other shoe to drop on USC. That's that's just how I am. That's just how I operate. And I, but if you if you're asking me, am I going to uh, take a team here? I, I USC to win, but I don't like I don't like that amount of points. Seventeen is a lot of points, but you're right. I mean, the week one game against San Jose State is just one of those classic. You just you just every year that's a game that USC you you go in and it's like oh they'll they'll kill this team, and then it's in the fourth quarter and it's a three point game. It's like what how you, you know you have way better football players than they do, and the answer is no. They never realize that <laughs> this year like San Jose State it was just it was thirty to seven. It was the, there was never a question really in the in the second half of that game. It was just they they were just kind of in in control. Stanford Stanford got bludgeoned by. K State. State. Yeah. K State just clobbered them last week. I think it was 24 to 7. And you know, that's that's a concern because Stanford, like St- Stanford and K State are kind of uh like spiritual brothers from like completely opposite places. You know, it's like you know, separated at birth twins, and one lives in the, you know on the equator and one lives on the North Pole. Like Manhattan, Kansas, and Palo Alto, California are uh, two people who have never been in my kitchen, put it that way. But they run. I mean, they're they're both kind of like that power power running attack teams, and then and Stanford just got their heads caved in. That's that's a little concerning. I'm starting to wonder if David Shaw is going to be able to turn this around again, or if this is you know you have seen the, the peak of the David Shaw mountain at, at Stanford, and now you're kind of shushing down the uh, the uh, downslope of that. That that's that's a little concerning to me. If they couldn't score on. K State, I'm not sure how much they're scoring on USC this year. And USC, you know, I mean, they're not incredible, but if if you're giving up 10 points, you know, 28 to 10, is that is that crazy? 20, 27 no. to 7, is that crazy? I mean, I, if I was going to do something, I would give the points. It's a lot of points. Like I'd feel a lot better if it was 14 points and not 17. But mm-hmm. yeah, there's there's there is some collapse signs around the uh, Stanford program right now that that are a little concerning and you know this is this is the fifth straight year that Clay Helton is coaching for his job so y- you've you've got to think that they're you know they, they will be as focused as they can be so yeah I'm I would I would tend towards USC on this one as focused as they can be at USC which is like yeah I don't know a daycare at lunchtime <laughs> I do wonder like David Shaw not that he's overstayed his welcome but has he gone past the point of being a hot commodity or can he still go if, Hey, if I want that Michigan job, can I have it? That sort of thing. Like, is he still that guy? I don't think so. I mean, it, it feels like he missed his window. Maybe mm-hmm. that, that, you know, five years ago. Yes. That, but 
you know, even, even three years ago, maybe, but it just, it feels like he's kind of, he's on the downslope right now. And I don't, I don't know how you pull, pull out of that spin. Well, and we'll see 19, 2019, they were four and eight last year. They were four and two, won their last four games by like three points or less. And maybe that's, you know, a, a season built entirely yes. on close wins in a pandemic season. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. That sound. I don't know what part of that doesn't sound sustainable. Exactly. So we'll see where he is this year and it doesn't look like he's going to be in a, in a good position that will do it. Tom, do you have anything else before we go? No, I think, I think we've covered the the big ones, the most, the most uh, significant games. It's not, it is not an incredible week of football, but here's what it is. A week of college football, which you know what that makes it a pretty good week. And also one last thing, Tom Rutgers is a road favorite for the first time since, do you know when give me a year and I'll tell you if you're correct. Rutgers as a road favorite, I, I'm going to say it's got to be. Is it is it a Shiano year or is it a very imminently post Shiano year? I'm going to say like uh, 2011. No, sooner than that. I believe it was a Kyle Flood year. I believe it was uh, 2015 against Army. They were uh, like a four or five point favorite at Army and one by 10. So wow. they are a favorite at Syracuse or as some people say, Syracuse. And uh, good luck to the Scarlet Knights there. So that will do it. Thank you all for watching. Thank you all for listening. As always, check out BuckeyeScoop.com. And if you're not yet a member, please become one. If you are, thank you for that. Also, you can find us at YouTube.com slash slash Buckeye Scoop. Check out all of our great podcasts. We've got a ton of them, a lot of great quality content that uh, you can you know just search Buckeye Scoop on all of your platforms and you'll see a bunch of different options. Find something to your liking and uh, check it out and subscribe. So thank you all for listening. Thank you for watching. We will talk to you later.